Hi guys, Dane here, and Biggie's here as well, and today I'm going to be making a start at least on my review of The Cowardly Lion of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. So this is a continuation of the Wizard of Oz books written after L. Frank Baum's death. Um, this is kind of a buddy read with Joel Swagman, but really we just both ended up at our own pace and our own schedule, and I don't even know if he's going to read this far. But I'm sticking with the series for now. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads The Cowardly Lion of Oz in which not a bit more, the circus clown accidentally utters the transformation spell that sends him and Bob up, the orphan boy, from the US to the Munchkin Kingdom of Mudge, where Mustafa, the irascible ruler, magically compels them to try to capture the famously cowardly lion for the royal menagerie. The lion, on a secret mission of his own, finds them instead. Together with Nick, the bird with a telephone beak, they escape from the Skyle of Un and the bottled city of Preservatory, meet an enemy disguised as a friend, and return to Mudge in an, in an attempt to save the cowardly lion from a hard, cruel fate. Um, so it's quite a cool edition, it's a lot better than some of these public domain editions I've had recently. And straight away, uh, basically the king wants a final lion to finish off his collection, which is 9,999 lions. And um, his advisor, Tazziwalla, he goes, But there are no more lions in Mudge. Your Highness must know that. The royal hunters have tracked them all down. And even if there were more, we cannot afford another single lion. I beg of your Highness to consider the 9,999 already eating us out of our sandals. The Mudges are complaining of the lion tax. And I love the idea of a lion tax. And so Notta, the clown, um, he runs out of his clown makeup. Well, he, they get transformed, trans transported rather there. Um, and obviously he doesn't have his gear with him. So um, luckily, um, Bob has some marshmallows, so he ends up powdering his face with a marshmallow, which I'm not convinced would work. But I suppose in Oz, you've got to suspend your disbelief, haven't you? Now I love this. Um, well, we're still going north. Not a look complacently at a large signpost that stood at the beginning of the lane. North Road to D, said the sign briefly. Wonder what D stands for? Because it can't sit down. That to me, that's some like goon show style humour, I really enjoyed that. I actually turned that, uh, told my friend Joe, you could turn that into a, a pickup line where you'd say, I'm not going to give you the D, I'm going to give you the Z. What does the Z stand for? Because it can't sit down. Um, but she said that gave her the ick, so we're not using it. Oh, and this, speaking of dating and, and the D, this sounds painful. Anyone caught stealing the Queen's door jam shall have his knob twisted and every door in the kingdom slammed on him besides. Please don't twist my knob, that sounds painful. Let me get this, why is a tomato like a book? Because it grows on a vine, answered King Theodore sulkily, and you needn't scream at me like that. Wrong, said Notta triumphantly. A tomato's like a book because it's red through. Doesn't really work for my tomatoes because they're still green, but I'm hoping they will ripen before the end of summer. And Notta has a great little joke, he goes, if the clouds rolled away, would they be missed? Hmm. If Sting dies, will he become stung? And the comfortable camel says, I've got a hunch. And Scraps replies, where? On your back? Probably, he is a camel. We get somebody asking, are you a friend of Dorothy's? Which I was talking to Joel about, Joel Swagman, um, because friend of Dorothy became like a slang term for a gay person because of these books. And Well, I think specifically because of the movie. We get this quite profound line here. To laugh at someone who was funny was one thing, but to be funny yourself, well, that was different. And I think that hits the nail on the head. That's why we need to be more understanding of other people and their differences, you know? Someone goes, oh my quills and feathers. Um, which just reminded me of my friend Jana. Uh, she's like a colleague as well at a client, but she has a lot of what we call Jana-isms. So, you know, nice expressions that are better than saying, oh, fucking shit, you know? So hers is, I think, um, so now I can't remember what hers is. It's not, it's not stars and whiskers, is it? It's something like that. Oh yeah, and then the 9,999 lions get turned to stone and we get, as for Mustafa, he grew amazingly rich from the sale of his stone lions. And you can see them any fine day, guarding the doors of public buildings or standing proudly in the various parks of Oz. And I just like that idea that that's where some of the, you know, the stone lions, the decorative stone lions that we see come from. So yeah, all in all, The Cowardly Line of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. I thought in this one, Thompson kind of found her voice as her own storyteller. Now granted, she is still trying to write like L. Frank Bourne, um, but she's also kind of put her own stamp on it by this point as well. Um, so it feels a little bit less derivative. Um, a lot of fun. I would give it, it's like a strong 3.5 out of 5 and, you know, a nice little continuation to the series. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Cowardly Line of Oz by L. Frank Borms, well, by Ruth Plumley Thompson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.